Welcome to Wings of Arrow Advanced Education and Research Organization. To know more, visit our official web page www.wingsofarrow.in. And you have heard several talks the previous day, and I'm sure this is one uh, particular slide which I got from Dr. Adimuthi, and he would have described this in yesterday's talk of how the a, a, a launch vehicle which starts from lift off and injection. What are all the various problems that is being encountered during its course through the atmosphere? Uh, where, where you have uh, the shock oscillations, that is during the transonic conditions, we have the changes in the pressure that causes uh, loads, heating, jet interactions, etc. So, I just uh, since this would have been covered yesterday, I will I, I go fast. And this is the basically the various phases in the in the uh, in the launching. First is on the launch pad, you know, where you when the vehicle is at the launch pad, we have the wings coming and we estimate the loads on the wind, and then you have also the vortex shading, and we also study whether it is has a likelihood of hitting with the debris which become uh, going around. That's called the collision avoidance study for a safe lift off window. And then the lift off phase, we have the sudden starting of the nozzles, which sends in huge pressure waves called the pressure, pressure. And the jets also creates a lot of unsteady forces, acoustics. So, acoustics and the reverse for hot gases. And then when it is clearing the tower, you have to see whether it is a sufficient clearance between the tower and the vehicle and uh, adequate conductivity exists or not. And then we have in the subsonic zone where we see that we turn the vehicle so that the loads are minimized. That's called the initiation of the gravity turn. And then we come to the transonic zone. That is, on, from the subsonic, we come to the transonic zone where you have the most of the aerodynamic issues, like the higher levels of aerodynamic noise that is caused due to the shock oscillations. As you know, when the flow transits from the subsonic flow to supersonic flow, you cannot avoid shock waves. <coughs> so there are shock waves are there. And this creates vibrations, and this response of this shock oscillation structure is called the buffeting, the vibrations. And then, as it goes, you also need to vent out the the gases that are inside because you have trapped gases inside the compartments, which is on the order of one atmosphere. And as you go up, the outside atmosphere pressure is less, and so it will exert load on the structures. And then you also have the control structure interactions because you have the control forces too. As the vehicle itself is not aerodynamically stable, you always have to have control. And then control ability. And then you also have the loads. And then you always align with the wind so that you reduce the loads when it is going uh, in the atmospheric phase. And then coming to the supersonic zone, we also have the jet interaction which I will cover. And then these, uh, these, these stages separate as the previous speaker was telling that we should try to reduce the, the masses uh, to have higher uh, payloads. So you have one separation whenever they uh, reach their uh, uh, job, it has to separate it. And then it has to go and impact the stage zone. <coughs> and all these aspects are there. And when it is uh, stage is separated, we have to see whether it is caught in the safe waters. It should not fall in some other place where it is populated. And then we should also ensure the collision free separation. And then, of course, in the heat shield separation, we should have adequate margins. So, once it is heat shield, where you can see that the atmosphere is co-opted, and these are some of the losses that are coming. One is, of course, it has to go again, work against the gravity. So, it is the gra gravity loss is there. And then there are some losses because the nozzle don't expand fully. So, you have the pressure losses. And then, when you steer the vehicle, you also have a steering losses. So, now the main the target is how to take this vehicle and put it in the orbit by minimizing these losses so it is orbit in the best possible trajectory so it is posed as a mathematical problem find out various functions in space which will give the best payload so this is what the essence of trajectory design is and we have all these selections that is first you have some constraint because initially you have to lift off vertically then you have to turn because that is where you align with the gravity and then and so you have all these things are there, so you have the turn. Then you cannot turn the fast also, you have some turning rates are there. So all these things are, uh, uh, are uh, put in the trajectory design. And then finally you have the uh, trajectory shape. So this is these are some of the typical guidelines for the GSLD trajectory. For example, you say that 
you have to uh, vertical time is up to 90 meters it has to fly vertically because you have the tower and then the strap on when it separates you have the acceleration these constraints are there then altitude range restricted so much so all these constraints are put and the planetary is designed and the air handle and tail when the stages are impacted it should not it should impact only at this within this zone so that it is falling in the safe waters all those issues are there <coughs> and these are some of the typical uh, launch vehicles of the what are the aerodynamic and aerothermal problems <coughs> for this launch vehicles? So the, on the left side you have all the aerodynamic problems and on the right side you have all the aerothermal problems. The aerodynamic problems is first you can start from the, if you are starting from the top is the compartment venting. This is where the satellite is housed. So the satellite which is housed and then this is going through the atmosphere, you know it's, it's, it's is one bar. And then as it goes up, the atmosphere pressure drops. And if there is no venting, that is if the, the, uh, the pressure inside is atmosphere and outside pressure is very low, then you have a huge structural load coming and which will buckle the structure. So normally what is done is, we have some venting provision so that it equalizes with the outside pressure. So now the question is, what are the vent hole design? How do you design? Where do you put these holes? So that will depend on how how, you, how much you want to vent it? That is, you have to design the vent hole in such a way that at any time the difference between the external pressure and internal pressure is within the limits. So, that is the venting. Second thing is the buffeting, as you told. Now, you can see here, we normally air dynamics, we don't like to have sudden change in shapes. But some things are inevitable. For example, you have a large satellite and you have this motor. So, there, there should be a, a boat tail. Now, how do you, how do you do this angle so that you have minimum of the unsteady loads that are coming. So that is the choosing this angle, both tailing angle. <coughs> then you have the strap on, wherein you have in the uh, in the supersonic flow, what will happen is you have the shock coming here and they interact with the core and they have the shock interactions uh, uh, associated aerodynamic noise. And then get, there, these are jettisoning rockets, you know, they jettison once it's functioning over. And then what happens is what is the jettisoning rocket impinging on the core? So this has to be found out. Then of course, during the lift off, what is the aerodynamics? The overall coefficients is very important because as this launch vehicle is essentially unstable, we have to give the uh, the forces and moments on this vehicle to the control people so that they have they see that at every twenty milliseconds it, it, it finds out what is the uh, position it has to uh, next achieve and then accordingly it has to control. And the jet noise, and then the jets, jets they interact and they form a base heating, and this will come. And this is the and the, the, the doors on the nozzle. On the right side, you can see all this uh, heating on the structure, the, the thermal management of the equipment base, the heating leak when it's a cryo. You have to see that it should not be, the, there should not be heating from outside so that you know it, it, the, 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 ox, the liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen has to be maintained at the temperature. <laughs> and this aerodynamic heating should not spoil that. And we have so many insulations also coming. And there are also some special problems uh, which the previous speaker covered with the human in space uh, mission. <coughs> and then these are some of the challenging things like the planetary re entry or thermodynamics. And also, the, we have the Chandrayaan 2 lander is going to take place where you have the multi engine jets and the dust reversal. And we are going to have a landing experiment of the uh, RLV. Of course, the Gaganyaan, which is much talked about, which will also be there in 2022. <coughs> And also, we are also working on a rocket which is uh, uh, minus D. So, this is all in the initial phase. And this is the infrastructure building. So, already we have a hypersonic tunnel and we are uh, building a 1.2 meter trisonic tunnel. And also, we will be having shortly a two cutoff of supercomputing facilities for uh, solving various problems. <coughs> now, I will just take you to some of the uh, live cases uh, which has been installed. <coughs> some practical problems which gives a glimpse of the types of aerodynamic problems and how we have solved them. So this is one of the uh, typical problems in the first vehicle when we launched of the DSLV where we had a fire at one of the strap ons and uh, that was because you know this uh, there was a problem in this uh, uh, N40 that is the, the strap on engine which there was a blockage and it, if those four strap ons they do not generate the equal thrust or the, the thrusts are not within certain limits, they will be shut down. And when it is shut down, what will happen? There is a fuel rich propellant coming out, and there is also outside 
uh, oxygen which, uh, which uh, burns and then it uh, catches fire. But what is interesting is although the fuel is coming out from all the four strap ons, only one of them caught fire. And it was uh, then interesting to find out why only one had this. So when the simulations were carried out with the, uh, uh, with the combustion effect, what we can see is because the wind conditions prevailing at the time, it was uh, in such a condition that there was a dead zone that was here coming here and we, because of uh, free, uh, the convection, it was uh, coming in the one strap. With these simulations, we were able to ca capture the uh, particular phenomena. And this is the regular lift off of the uh, launch vehicle and uh, this is at the launch pad. So you can see just two seconds after that there was a there was a, a the jet reversal that is the flow of the hot gas between the tower and the weight. Now what was the reason for this? This also was put to simulations. This is the GSLU at the 5 meter height and you have on the launch pedestal and uh, and you could see that there is indeed a, a, a jet, a reverse flow of the jet that is there, the strap on jet going up. And now this has to be prevented. So, the simulation, if you see, this is from the top view. When the jet impinges, it goes in all directions, you can see here. So, what happens is in this direction, there is a um, umbilical is there. So, it does not does not permit it to go this side. So, what happens if you take a section at this point, what you can see here is there is a fountain jet that is formed. So it is the cause of this fountain jet that is uh, creating this issue. So what you need to do is actually prevent this jet from going in this direction. So when the jet continues, it will go in this direction, other one will go in that direction, it will not allow the uh, fountain jet to be formed. And that was what we could uh, simulate before the flight. This is with the fountain jet preventer, and this was what has happened in the first flight. <coughs> And uh, you can see here, <coughs> this is the simulation which shows that the, the jets are going in this direction. And we also have a video to show the, compare the, uh, the two flights. You can see here, this was the first flight and this was the, with the fountain jet. Just after two, two seconds, you will see. <coughs> there is a gas going lower slow, but here you don't you don't see that. And if you go very close, and uh, the camera which is uh, near the so this is with the fountain jet preventer, you can see the gas is going in this direction. High speed photography and the thermal frames, you can see here the So, this is the, the typical uh, launch vehicle where you have several compartments, you know, these are all uh, compartments which has to be rented out. <coughs> and this is how the pressure is uh, inside the uh, compartment, it is started uh, with a atmospheric pressure and then it is. Uh, coming to the free stream pressure and the differential pressure that is the inside pressure minus outside pressure should not exceed something like a plus minus the process. So this is what the the, uh, the measurement from the flight as well as the design is. <coughs> okay and we have the several compartments which all are within the uh, plus minus 10 kp. So let us come to some of the uh, typical flow problems. This is typically a flow field at Mach number 0.9. So you can see here, and the it has uh, it, we can say it is something like all types of flow is seen. It is something like a fluid dynamic groove. You can say where you have to start with the flow is laminar, then it transits to turbulent. You have a turbulent attached flow, <coughs> and then you have the shock wave that is there is mark number 0.9. This is the coefficient of pressure Cp, and this is a a shock wave is found there. And then in the shock wave you also have then you have accretion. Then you have an expansion fan in this region and there will be there will be separated flow in this region and you have the base flows that are there, multi-jet interactions, large scale vortices. So all types of flow is seen in this type of uh, launch vehicle and our main aim is to characterize this and to find out what is the forces, moments, pressure, distribution for this type of typical flow conditions. 
and this is the transonic flow and this is the supersonic flow. <coughs> and when you have a reverse flow and the beads uh, get into interactions, these hot gases go back and heat the base. And for which you have to have a suitable protection system for the base heating. Now, what is interesting is now that, let us say if you take at Mach number 0.95, which is very close to 1, we have a normal shock, and we have at the foot of the normal shock, we have the largest unsteady, unseen of coming. And we also have measurements at this point, and we find that at this particular point, you have the maximum acoustic levels. So, this, this also shows the correlation between steady and the unsteady type of uh, flow. <coughs> And this is the, uh, the the vehicle that is first we had the LVM3 X which has a, a, a straight nose cone. And you can see here at Mach number 0.95 there is a large separation that is there. Because of the large separation you also have a large amount of unsteady loads. And when we did the measurements inside, we found <coughs> that there are the, the acoustic levels are rather high. And then I will come to the subsequent vehicle for which we did a better configuration for this. Replacing this cone with a giant so that you have a lower acoustic level. And what is interesting is if you see here the flow that is separated here, no, it gives a very large downward load, <coughs> so which means it pushes the XCP, that is the center of pressure, backwards to as high as something like 6 meters. So you can see a very large drop in the, uh, in the XCP uh, that is coming here. So it is moving back by something like 22 and this is 16 meters. So, this, because of this flow separation, we have unsteady effects, we have the even the steady uh, the forces and moments also in the dark scene. And you can see here the acoustic levels are also quite high of the order of 160 dBs. And this is the, uh, the acoustic level that is measured internally, and you can see here this is the limit, and then we are slightly exceeding these limits. And uh, so, uh, at this, the, at the low frequency bands of 31 and 63 hertz. And this is at this region where you have the measurement and you can see here this is the internal measurement at the flight. You can see here there are also very high of the order of 168 dB. These are all very high acoustic levels that are providing on the launch vehicle. So now the aim is to see how do we reduce this levels by suitably shaping this. So this is the shape that is proposed in this subsequent vehicle. So you can see here is an agile shape and you have a standard nose cone. And this was the previous one. <coughs> so with this we had the subsequent two flights and then we could see here that we had done internal tests and shown and also CFD simulations there you can see here there are some flow separated here at point 8 whereas we do not see a very smooth type of uh, flow here on the heat chain of course the motor will have some separation and you can see here the straps are also very weak because it is a gradual expansion because of the uh, ojai shape. <coughs> And uh, these are the acoustic levels. You can see here, this was the previous, the straight nose cone and the ojai nose cone. You can see substantial reduction in the acoustic levels, which is also visible in the shadow maps that are there from the wind tunnel. <laughs> and we will just see the uh, And this is of the Ojai. So you don't see a large step the top person puts it on this side and there's a large separation in front there. And you can also see from the flight data also. The shops are much weaker. And you can clearly see the reduction in acoustic levels because of this. <coughs> well, there is another interesting thing was also the region where we notice very high acoustic levels here, and that is because you can see here we have a, if you have a standard nose cone, there is an attachment to this, and there will be a flow that is behind the attachment. Okay, there is a behind this attachment, the section, and behind the attachment forms a wake. 
and you also have a shock that is formed from the snow score and the shock and this wave will interact called the shock vortex interaction okay so now we can see how the shock vortex interaction was there in the straight nose cone Here. Had to go. So, this, this shows a larger type of flow separation. You can see here the shock vortex interaction is much stronger here, but much weaker in this case, mainly because in the slanted nose cone, you can see here this side the shock will be very weak. So, what happens is because you have almost a flat region here, so the interaction is much weaker, and this resulted in much lower acoustic levels measured in that. In this region. So, from the slanted nose cone to the straight nose cone, the shock vortex interaction was considerably reduced, which reduced the acoustic levels on the launch vehicle. So, by suitably shaping the next subsequent vehicle, we had very low acoustic levels and very benign environmental levels, which is uh, uh, essential for this uh, launch vehicle. And you can see here, these are the measurements which we made in the second flight and this was the first flight. You can see here the reduction that is there. From the, the the X vehicle to the uh, the X vehicle to this uh, the, uh, the D1 vehicle that is where we had the Ojai nose cone both standard and the Ojai nose cone you can see a substantial reduction is there see 160 has become something like 152 and 168 has become 160 so all these levels have considerably come down because of the shaping on this the Ojai nose cone the standard nose cone and also we also shape this some of these protrusions more uh, in the streamlined fashion. <laughs> and this is the, the uh, level which was measured inside the heat shield. You can see here from 140 it has come down to much something like 120 dB. So, this is the, the benefit which got uh, by uh, suitable shaping. And also, we had a lot of uh, steady measurements on this vehicle to see the, how the pressures are so that you can also cross check the. Uh, uh, structural uh, uh, adequacy and all these uh, pressure measurements are done in flight and then we compare with our predictions. So, there is one interesting, uh, you know, now you can see here, this is, we had a measurement at the nose point. And there we found that the measurements that are shown in the continuous line are larger than what we had measured predicted. Now, the question was why this has happened? See, the measurements are actually made in a cavity because uh, there is a we had put a sensor there and cavity is there and there, is, there will be and inside this cavity we have made this measurement. So if you bring this effect of this cavity, then what really happens is the the measurement is uh, the the prediction goes near the measurement. So because of the measurement made inside the cavity, higher pressure that was there as compared to what should have been without the cavity. And this is another uh, place on the Ojai nose cone where we have the flight measurements and the predictions. So now, uh, so that means we can say that the predictions at the attached course are uh, the the uh, the course are able to predict this uh, this particular things in a very uh, uh, in a in a better fashion. And this is again on the cylindrical region where we have these measurements. And uh, these are the where the shock is there at the near the mass number one, and uh, these are the measurements as compared to the predictions. <coughs> and this is on the boat tail region. Of course, there we have there are some deviations because you know when the flow is getting separated at this region, when the flow gets separated, you have the, the, the turbulence modeling, all those effects come into picture. So the predictions do deviate at certain uh, uh, transponic mass numbers. <coughs> and this is at the interstage where we have the uh, uh, prediction as well as the uh, measurements and here also you know we have the, the loads that are being calculated based on the pressure and we see that there is a fairly good comparison with that. And now uh, let us see the, the, the methodology which we estimate the loads. <coughs> now how do you make the uh, predict the loads on this? Now you can see here this particular vehicle as it flies is a 3 3 beam. So, what we need to do is there are some interstate structures which need to be designed. Now, if you take the uh, launch vehicle design, what really happens is after you design.
decide first you decide what is the payload you want to put in the orbit accordingly you size the vehicle then you have the trajectory design and once the trajectory is designed then you have to get the aerodynamic loads so when the aerodynamic loads are obtained there is a load distribution that is there and based on the load distribution you have the structures are designed and structures have to be very optimally designed because you cannot have two structural factors that you have for the civil structures because it costs the payload Hence, the accuracy in this prediction is very important. We cannot put large margins in this case. And <coughs> hence, it is uh, it's very important to see that we get it as accurate as possible. And so, what we do is we do both the internal testing, we make internal models, and also the computational flow dynamics. Now, we also know that the internal models cannot be exact replica of what is there, right? Because we have limitations in simulating very small, small protrusions, we have the skin effect. All those issues are there, so you need to correct for them. So this is what is done. Actually, you synthesize, you make a data in which you use the internal data, you use the CFD data, you synthesize both of them, and then give the final data. So this is what is done. So we can see here, this is the vehicle, and this is the the internal model, and then you have the geometry correction. That is, there are some things which are not simulated in the internal. So you correct them for the geometry by CFD. And then you also have the jets, and because of this jets, what happens is the flow here gets changed, which is not simulated in the car. So that also you have corrections. That is also done internal is also done. And so the error data is basically a internal test data and the geometry correction from the CFD and also the jet corrections. Sometimes it can be from either from internal or from the CFD. So this is how the overall <laughs> way in which you generate the data using both internal as well as CFD. This is called the synthesis. Okay, this is how a typical load distribution for a launch vehicle should look like. This is called SDC NASA, it is a load per meter. So, this is the load distribution that goes to the structures. And then we will use this and get the each of these interstages, all each of these positions, what is the bending moment and the shear force. And based on the bending moment and shear force, the structural designer will design its structure. So, that is how the cycle goes. <coughs> Now, there is an effect of jets on the stability. Now, we can see the internal tests are done without jets. But actually, the vehicle during the uh, launch, you have the jets and they have interaction and then they will cause these changes in the pressure distribution here, which can change the optimal forces and moments. So, this is the jet off data and this is the jet on data. You can see here, up to here, there is no change from these two flow fields. But this region, you can see because of the multi jet interaction. There are changes in the pressure here. So, what is the effect of that? So, now what we can see here is the center of pressure without the jet was actually forward. I mean, backward. Of course, it is also, as you know, this launch vehicles are inherently unstable. In the FCG, the center of gravity is always behind the center of pressure. And so, you always require a control moment. <coughs> but we see that we do not have a very large instability, <coughs> static margin is this in. in Instability margin is not very large. Okay. Now, what happens is with the jet, we can see here the FCG actually moves forward. And when you take into account this, we see that we have a better match with the flight data as compared to this FCG jet. That means there is a necessity to to have a change in the FCG because of the jet. This effect needs to be taken, and this was what was done for the GSLV vehicle. And you can see here there is something like. Uh, this much movement is FCP by D, which jet on is 10.04 and this is 10.89, and there is also a reduction in the normal force. So, there is a reduction in the normal force here, so which moves the FCP forward. <coughs> well, this is another interesting problem <coughs> where you have this is the nozzle and you have this uh, shroud here. So, when the flow comes, it will come and re attack on the nozzle. Now, these nozzles are symboled for. So, what really happens is this, this gimbal is against a aerodynamic load. So, what really happens is the control people need to take account of this aerodynamic load that is coming because of reattachment. Now, the question is how do you reduce this unwanted aerodynamic load? So, what was done was there has a flare shroud was put so that when the flow is coming up, it will not reattach somewhere here, it will take it farther down. It was what was done here for the uh, GSLE vehicle, and we found that this is the uh, with the uh, 
without the demand and this is uh, sorry without the flare crowd and this is the flare crowd you can see that right? the high pressure zone was substantially reduced lower loads on the nose <coughs> and this was also experimentally done and we have the uh, uh, pressure measurements at the nose uh, point and we could see that because of the flare crowd we could reduce the load on the nose and the and this is the match of the internal pressure and the computational now come to the another uh, problem which was the source of heating so we have various pieces in which we have heating during the pre launch phase this is basically solar heating and conductive heat transfer from the ambient atmosphere then the lift off we have the solid uh, motors and and this the, the particles the radiation from the solid particles one of the very important source of heating which has to be quantified then convective heating as it goes through the aerodynamic atmosphere then in the other phase we also have aerodynamic heating and then the exhaust tube due to the multi cyclic and then solar heating which is is called one fan which is a maximum of 1135 watts per meter square <coughs> and these are some of the methodologies of course you have the elaborate methodology of using a computational tool and estimating that is hey, all the time not employed because you want to have good engineering methods that right? you have the forward uh, region you have the bestay and radial band these these are some of the empirical methods which are really uh, very good in estimating the heat flux on this uh, vehicle and based on the heat flux we calculate the thermal response and this is the uh, thermal response calculation we have the aerodynamic heating on the structure solve this conduction equation and get the temperature and we also have a types of pps pps some some which are uh, ablated that is it is ablated and uh, and some which are not so not ablated and which is as a insulator and this is the uh, this are some of the tps materials and this is the typical temperatures that are uh, coming on the launch vehicle <coughs> and on the base heating is, we have the air 203 particles which have strong radiation and because of the radiation you have high heat fluxes and then uh, so this has to be protected against the heat flux and uh, during the convective heating where the jets interact we have the reverse flow and there is a more convective heating taking place and these are some of the basic heating uh, convective and radiative heating and how the uh, there are engineering methods also for this and uh, <laughs> this is the typical flow field how the <coughs> and as it goes higher and higher the altitude see in the lower altitude you are jet pressure to the atmospheric pressure called the pj by p infinity the jet will not expand so much so you don't have the base heat that's the mark number 0.8 so slowly as the mark number increases like mark number 2 the slowly the jet start expanding and then at 2.5 they start interacting and there's a reverse flow and 3 3.5 they are all the base heating becomes more interaction because they are swimming more the outside ambient pressure is less and hence <coughs> there is a large amount of base heating taking place which has to be quantified quantified using this uh, the uh, cfd tools and based on that uh, the heat flux the thermal protection system is designed so this is how a typical base looks like you know you have the core thermal shroud and the core base shroud and this is where you have the the, uh, the thermal boot okay because this has to be gimballed and so there should be something flexible but it should not also allow the hot gases to go back so this has to be designed for this base heating and <coughs> these are the the the, the thermal boots here and thermal boots in the uh, salt uh, strap on <coughs> and we do lot of tests in the and this is a multi layer insulation uh, several layers of uh, insulation materials are there and this is evolved experimentally <coughs> Heat flux that are there, and this is uh, put on the kinetic heating facility. There, with radiant heat is heating, this heat is uh, subjected to this uh, this particular thermal boot, and we measure the back wall and see whether the the back wall constraints are met or not. Something like 120 degrees. So this is the constraint. That is, although the front wall is high, the back of the uh, the thermal protection system should be within 120. So design a thermal protection system. it will give this much heating in the front wall but the back wall should be 120 so this is done using experimental uh, method and then this uh, particular thing is put on the flight <coughs> and there are also other interesting problems like you 
know, we have the uh, flux nozzle system. So what will happen if this oil is discharged and there is a flame that is coming, whether it will burn and what is the effect of that. So all these small, small all these problems, although it's not, you have to pay here, but you do experiments, you do computations, and uh, you do several, uh, several of them, and then basically assess the situation and see whether it is critical or not. So this is one such problem that is attempted. And then what we see is, and you know, here also you have the whole, whole range of fluid mechanics. By when the oil is coming out, whether it will become spray or not spray, <coughs> okay, that depends on the various uh, uh, non dimensional parameters, non dimensional numbers. And then we can see that when, and this is the oil, how the oil consumption is there. Then oil consumption is there towards the end phase. This is called the typical cycle, <coughs> duty cycle is there. So when there is a, when it is coming at a very high altitude, <coughs> and when the temperatures are large, what you find is in the altitude you don't have sufficient oxygen. So even if the oil comes out, it doesn't really cost much. So this is how the decisions were taken. <coughs> now we come to the hypersonic aerothermodynamics. So we had a successful mission of the space recovery experiment, which was an orbit re-entry. And then we also had an ROV TD, which you would have heard from yesterday. And this is uh, the crew escape system. And uh, these are some of the hypersonic Mach number uh, cases. And you know, in aerothermodynamics of re-entry, uh, you move all the way from the free molecular flow to the continuum flow. So you have the free molecular flow and then you have the transition region and then you have what you call the regions which is called the non-equilibrium that is the, the reaction time and the flow times are similar. So it is called chemical non-equilibrium and uh, then you come to the lower regions where the reaction times are so fast <coughs> because the densities are larger and that is called chemical equilibrium and then comes the perfect gas. So all these regions are taken into account during the uh, predictions. And these are some of the typical uh, areas of concern like the corner shock interaction, flow separation and this is a typical uh, space recovery experiment with those uh, tiles, uh, silica tiles. <coughs> and this is the, the space uh, recovery experiment, re entry sequence where you de-boost, then you altitude correction is there, it re-enters and then you have the aerodynamic heating phase and uh, and then you have the parachute is there, the broke and the pirate parachute and then it Splash down the sea, <coughs> and when it comes down, it is around 12 meters per second. <coughs> so that is the the the, the deceleration as required by the parachutes. Now, when you want to solve this, you know because of very high uh, speeds, the uh, very high temperatures coming. What happens is the uh, the, the air species which contains uh, nitrogen, oxygen, they don't remain as it is. So you have to take into account the species uh, change, the change in species. There will be dissociation of oxygen at 2000 Kelvin and dissociation of nitrogen at 4000 Kelvin and then you have the nitrous oxide that is becoming nitrogen and the uh, uh, N and O and then there will be also an electron cloud that is formed there. and when electron cloud is formed in front of the wake, you will not be able to transmit signals. So you have something called a communication blackout. So in each region what you need to do is you have to store on board. So a priori you should know what is the time of communication blackout so that you can store the signal on board and then later transmit it. So all these things have to be predicted. So these are models available to predict this and this is what we do. Suppose we do a non-reaction model. This is a typical case where you have the, you have the shock here and you can see here the shock is much uh, thicker for a perfect gas and for a real gas where you account for the change in the uh, species eh? because the O2 becoming 2O is actually a dissociation reaction so it will take the heat for the dissociation and then here the gas becomes cooler, then the temperatures are smaller. Whereas if you assume that O2 remains O2, the temperatures are much larger, it is a non-critical, something like 20,000. So what happens when there is a cooler gas, a cooler gas can push more mass through a stream tube. So it the shock moves forward. So the shock stands up distance for a chemically reacting gas, chemically reacting air is smaller as compared to the shock layer of thickness for the perfect see the same thing in the density also, we can see larger density for a cooler gas. So these things are quantified and then you also measure the heat flux and based on this he uh, uh, designed this uh, thermal protection system, what is the thickness required for the silica tiles and you also have two extremes that is what happens is when this oxygen dissociates, they can come and recombine and then when they recombine there is a heat of recombination dumped on the wall. So that is one such is a fully catalytic wall. And this is a non-catalytic wall where they don't 
allow the recombination of these uh, species with nitrogen or oxygen and the actual flight measurements are somewhere in between. So, this is how you design. Design for a fully catalytic wall and see that yes, our flights are in between uh, uh, less than that. And we also uh, predict what is the effect of the pressure, stability of this liquid because of chemical. These are very difficult to obtain uh, in experiments because you cannot conduct experiments at such high mass numbers. It is difficult. Not that it is impossible, it is very difficult. And so you have this is the flight measurements, these are the uh, pressure. And uh, this is the, uh, uh, the, the the continuous line shows the uh, the flight measure, and these are the the dot measure that tell the different codes that are used to get the pressure distribution. <coughs> and what we find is because of the chemical reaction, it actually became more stable. And these are some of the typical phenomena of reentry uh, inorganization, where if very many any reenter, for example, the atmosphere or Jupiter, you reenter something like 50 kilometers per second. So there 99 percentage of the heating is radiative heating. Right? The soft layer that is formed is so hot that the most of the heating is coming from this radiation. That's called radiating shock layers. Whereas in the other cases, it is less than 10 km per second, it is mostly 98 percent is convective. And then we also here also we use various various methodologies to predict this heating that is coming on this vehicle and compare with the flight uh, results. Okay, now we also need to conduct these experiments in the atmosphere that is prevailing in the flight. For example, at higher altitudes, you know that the atmosphere pressure is less. So, your heat transfer also will vary. For example, the, as told by the previous speaker, they have lesser and lesser convective uh, heating. And so, we see that we have uh, something called the uh, chamber which is uh, simulating those conditions called the high altitude test facility. And we have heaters there and in this heaters, we mount the specimens and do the experiments. And we find that as you go uh, the lower and lower, the conductivity of this comes down because of the uh, lower pressure. And uh, so these things are taken into account and uh, the, all the experiments that are done is passes through an access, that is high altitude test facility. With that only the, all these things are cleared. So this is the process in which is done. Of course, all those outgassing and other things also are there. So this is a typical hatch chamber wherein, you know, we have the specimen and with the heaters, how the uh, uh, test is done and we, we measure the all the interface temperature, temperature at various location and you can see here ground test you see, you have a very high temperature coming but vacuum it is very less because the conductivity is very very low. <coughs> now coming to the RLV hex, which is another hyperphonic uh, uh, mission, where we had this uh, objectives of uh, hyperphonic thermodynamic design validation autonomous na navigation guidance and acquire the flight experience. <coughs> so here <coughs> we can see one of the important thing was the flush air data system that is can you predict the angle of attack from the flight measurement. This is one of the very challenging tasks. So we mount a, a flush air data system which is in the, in the spherical map you know where we have this uh, uh, pressure measurements in this nine uh, ports and based on the pressure measurements we get the alpha and you can see here this is what is uh, the computed and this is the measure from the flight and we also had uh, uh, come to the next one where we had the, the measurement of different parameters like the normal force coefficient how it uh, performed the estimated versus the, uh, the nominal one so here we can only have estimates because based on the trajectory you find out what is the normal force that is coming and these are the bands and, uh, and this is the accelerations and this is the drag coefficient. <coughs> of course, drag coefficient, we see there's a dispersion band within the dispersion band, but this still there is a scope for improving the uh, cap, uh, predict, uh, predicting capability. <coughs> and this is on the descent flight, what is the prediction of axial force coefficient versus the the, uh, the bands. So, this we, what we uh, normally do is all these predictions are made and see that whether it is within the bounds, first thing it should be within the bounds, if it is not within the bounds, then we have to have more uh, better prediction capability or increase the bounds, that is what is done. So, in this what we find here is the, uh, based on the uh, pre-flight predictions, the flight was as, more or less as expected. And we also have the CFD points also are there, so we can see here CFD experiments and the flight, they more or less corroborated for the uh, RLB TD, that is technology demonstrator flights. And this is again on the basic normal force coefficient with those uh, bounds. Both the uh, basic coefficient, then we have the flexible insulation, 
vertical page. So all these things we had uh, the uh, prediction. And you can see here, this is the one deflection and there is a gap. Now because of the gap flow, what is the heating? This also has to be predicted. And then you have to design a scene for this. So these are some of the practical problems we have to face. So we do a computation, get the heat flux, and then design a scene for that and see whether this, you can leave this gap as such, it can, whether the structure can withstand or you need to have uh, insulation. All these things are being worked out. And we also here, we also do a thermal structural test also. I think there is a next graph, yeah. So what we do is because it has both thermal as well as structural loads. <coughs> so thermal structural testing also is done for this, wherein we have the heaters, my model, and then we also have gas and uh, put uh, the, 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 the structural loads and see if the measures the strain. So see whether they are within the permissible limit. So this is the thermal simulation as well as the structural. So thermal structural simulations also are being carried out and predictions also are made. And this is the next proposed R limit. Uh, uh, <coughs> the next uh, uh, TD2 configuration, wherein we are going to mount it on the top of the gear simulation and then resolve on the operator. So, this is the um, uh, guideline that is given keep this same as the previous mission and then do a experiment in which we go up to the orbit and recover it back. <laughs> well, this is another interesting mission which was uh, uh, in, uh, in 2016 and uh, the next speaker is going to talk more about it <coughs> and wherein I uh, will talk about only on the, the aerodynamics aspect. Basically, the, the aim of this mission was to put it in the uh, uh, in this window and get the uh, the, uh, the performance of the scramjet engine. So, this is a low cost uh, sonograph experiment and this was our uh, flight trajectory wherein we started from Mark uh, 6 and then all the way went up to Mach 5 and then in between we had uh, the, uh, we had the flight measurements and we had, it, it went through the various dynamic pressure regimes and this is the, the vehicle and we have, this is a Mach 6, at Mach 6 we have this is the, uh, the scramjet portion where the intake is open, the intake is still that time it is closed, it will be open at that Mach 6 condition. And then there will be the flow will uh, go inside the intake, it will start, and then hydrogen is injected between the flux regions, and then we have the uh, combustion taking place. And you can see here what is interesting is this is the non reacting, that is, first when it is uh, started, when the intake is opened, we have the non reacting flow. So we can see here all these stops, this, uh, this, uh, this is a ramp, this is a ramp here, first ramp, second ramp, and then you have the cowl, and all those things are there. And then you have the expansion region, and then you have the soft top interaction. You can see up to the truck end, you don't see any difference in the flow field. Only the truck behind the truck, you have the pressure rise. So, whatever pressure rise is there is not communicated forward. So, this is what is called a supersonic combustion. So, the criteria is when you have a combustion taking place, it cannot influence the upstream condition. So, this was actually experimentally measured and then proved that yes, we could indeed get the supersonic combustion. So this is actually the, uh, we had pressure measurements along this center line and what we can see in the next slide, you can see the moment the hydrogen was injected, this blue line became like this. So up to here there is no change. So that means the combustion has occurred where only the downstream is changed without any upstream propagation. So this is called the supersonic combustion, that is how it is established. So this is one of the major technology demonstrated uh, and in a, so it's rather simply we talk about it, it was a for this. And these are some of the measurements which had at this region, you can see here throughout, you know, where we had, and this is actually the flame out region, where, you know, suddenly after that uh, there is a drop and the flame is uh, not, not there. So all this could be seen from this slide. <coughs> and we also had a internal experiments done to measure the acoustics on this, because this is the struts and then uh, the flow is there from this side and you can see here all these levels are quite high, 178, 177, 179, these are quite high levels and you know under this, under this you have all this uh, fuel, this equipments to okay, inject hydrogen and all and all these things has to be, you have to convert this acoustic levels, high levels of acoustics into vibration and this instruments have to be tested for that. So, the, so what was done was actually when you convert this into acoustic to vibration, it becomes a large levels. So, the experiment was found out to put the full vehicle, full uh, intake into the 
hypersonic internal chamber and get the transfer function that is what is the uh, relation between the acoustics and the vibration so that was what was done in the experiments and these are some of the uh, results which we got from the flight and this is the experiment, uh, experiment. so this is what is the o the flight uh, measured OSP overall sound pressure levels <coughs> okay okay so this is the some of the conclusion which we got uh, in the which the next speaker will highlight now the what is what next so next what we are trying to do is of course this is not a sanction one it is yet to get sanctioned and uh, this is we are going to mount it on top of a, 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 a suitable vehicle called the test vehicle which will take it to mark number 6 and then on its own it should map go from mark 6 to mark 7 using supersonic combustion so it should give a net t minus d positive it's a very challenging so you should uh, it should be a level flight uh, reasonably level flight lift to weight ratio should be 1 and then it should uh, uh, it should also uh, get the sufficient thrust to move from mark mark 7 this is something like telling that you can travel from travel to bandwidth to seconds so this is something like that and then you here you start a standard experiment and move from mark number 6 to mark 7 now what is interesting is this this vehicle should be airframe inducted standard that is something like it is not a you know this the the, the body also should act like a like an intake so that is how it should so it, because you should you should have a, your drag should be as low as possible because uh, your thrust minus drag should be positive which is very very challenging in case of a uh, uh, in a scram jet so this is how the the design was evolved <laughs> that is how to make the shape you know and you need fins for that is something like the okay, whatever existing uh, the scram jet engine which we had flown but we added put things there with radars here to see that they are all being able to control it and uh, the aerofoils so what type of aerofoil you should have we had this bike on aerofoil is what chosen and these are all various configuration evolution you see here some initial concept some 77 configurations where carried out through simulations and then finally we have arrived at the configuration which is okay this is some variation cases where you do with the kerosene combustion and see that we get whatever prediction and the measure test that is this is a typical uh, test conditions in a connected pipe mode where we inject uh, kerosene here and measure the pressure here and this is the prediction versus the uh, the experimental measure and so this is what is the the uh, comparison you can see here this is the typical uh, proposed vehicle which have so many struts and then you can see here this is a non combustion and then we have the combustion is here it is, this also is a supersonic combustion and with this this will be able to generate enough thrust to take it from Mark 6 to Mark 7. So these are the main challenges. That is the airframe injected standard engine to get T minus D greater than 0.15 G. And of course, main thing is we, the, the, how do you make this test uh, end to end with the uh, uh, to get the plus minus drive. And also the stability of the vehicle also is very important because stability in the presence of combustion is also a very important aspect. Now for doing all these things we have the high performance computing facilities here in house. This is around 450 teraflops which is a GPU based system <coughs> and now we are going to enhance it to uh, 2 petaflop facility and these are some of the typical problems solved. So you can see here this is a Chandrayaan 2 lander wherein you have these two jets, they, they, when they land you know they uh, uh, this jets uh, will throw some dust. So because of this a central engine also was uh, proposed and then because of this this jet reservoir is not there and this is another case where you have the uh, with the uh, RCS uh, how the reaction control uh, system uh, how the flow field looks like and this particular uh, thing which we have will be enhanced two petaflops and uh, with this we will be able to do much more go up to a, about 170 uh, 400 kilometer and uh, before that it go to 170 kilometer orbit and then these are the separate stages. Main thing is what we have to see here is at any time the crew has to escape. And then we also conducted some this uh, crew escape uh, system test. This is the, called the uh, uh, pad abort test. That is at the pad if you abort it, whether it can come and land safely. The crew can land safely or not. So these are all with the parachutes and with the crew module. Uh, wherein we, uh, the, the, crew, uh, the crew module reorients and then the parachute is deployed. And then it comes and lands in the sea. But aerodynamic part, the interesting part is this particular crew module, <coughs> if you are doing an internal test, you will not be able to do the test at the flight conditions because Reynolds number are larger. 
So what is done is this particular uh, case, this particular two module, if you have a smooth model, this will be the type of coefficient of fixing moment versus alpha because you know it can, can tumble and you should be able to predict this coefficient of fixing moment. But if the, uh, and you know that the model is, uh, um, uh, the Reynolds number is for the smooth, this Reynolds number is smaller for this and so a, a larger Reynolds number is similar to a rough model actually, so because flow you know is going to become turbulent and uh, so with the rough model you can see the, the pitching moment curve is like this and this is also coinciding with the more or less with the CFD predictions. So what is important here is for this large or uh, these band bodies, it is very important to trip it and this tripping cannot be done in one, uh, in one particular point, you have to put the grids throughout it and trip it and get the coefficients. So this is one of the important things which you could uh, uh, learn from this exercise and the flight which was to place you know, closely matching with this particular curve. Okay, and these are some of the uh, things which you are doing the shaping of this of this fairing. Uh, this is a double ogive, this is a cone ogive, and uh, this uh, exercises are carried out. And we see that this has a, although uh, you, you know it should have also have stability because as this vehicle is uh, flying independently and the astronauts are inside, we have stability provided by the grid fins and it should be stable. And hence, uh, uh, at the same time, if you have this uh, uh, cone, you have, uh, you know, this uh, there will be a shock that is formed here at say, sanhonic Mach numbers, whereas this particular case will have lower acoustics. So, you need to get both, you need to get stability as well as low, lower acoustics. So, that is what the exercises that have been done, components are done with these configurations. And finally, <coughs> my last slide, these are, although we are maintaining, there are still a lot of challenges. You can see here the basic understanding of turbulence is, this is a cartoon by Roscoe, <coughs> you know the famous uh, book of uh, Lipman, Roscoe, gas dynamics, elements of gas dynamics. So, he's telling what is turbulence. So, there is you know that turbulence, there is a cascading effect, you have a large scale, then you have universal range, then it finally comes in the Kolmogorov. So, if you see different parts, so you look at turbulence, you find sometimes you say Kolmogorov got it right. On one side of the elephant, you say it is a large structure. Otherwise, you say it's a fractals. Then you say it is a water sheets. Then it is a water sheet. So the turbulence is all this and much more. So the turbulent flow, basic understanding and modeling to get turbulence is a big challenge actually. If you can get it right, you know, one of the speakers I, I heard in a talk that if you can get this right, then you can save millions of dollars. Okay. You want to get the skin friction correctly, also is a very big challenge because in a 60% is a skin friction crash. Then computational error of is another very major uh, challenge because how to get the acoustics and the converting that into vibration. These are all still a uh, higher frontier areas of aerodynamics where you require uh, even computing standards also are very, very high. You simulate a large area simulation or higher simulation simulation. Your bit size is something like RE power 9 by 4. So RE power 9 by 4 you can match with billions and billions of cells. <laughs> Multidisciplinary optimization is also important because you do optimization not even. But if you want to bring in all things, I am sure yesterday Dr. Sandaj would have covered this. And some of these typical problems like jet flow, when is uh, when a lander is landing in the uh, in moon, you have some regions a continuum flow, then a transition flow, and a free molecular flow. So how do you have codes which are uh, which takes into all these things into account? So there are a lot of challenges, and uh, uh, it's very very interesting area. Eh? And uh, fluid dynamics is always uh, full of challenges. I say it's uh, although it is a. If you have further inquiry or requested video, drop down to our mail wingsofarrow at the rate gmail.com. Don't forget to subscribe for more updates. For the time being, take care, stay blessed, inspired, and fly high.